Exodus 19, and take notes as we go because there's going to be a lot of notes uh, that you guys can take on. We're following from the ESV. Uh, Exodus 19, verse 5 and verse 6. This is what the Bible says. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, underline obey my voice, and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. Verse 6, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, underline kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. Actually, go back and underline uh, be to me as well. Be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you will speak to the people of Israel. Now, I want you to come down to Exodus 20, uh, a chapter later. Uh, Moses is taking this message And he is conveying this message to the people of Israel as he's heard it from God. Now, verse number 18, this is what the Bible says. Now, when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off, verse 19, and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen. Do not let God speak to us lest we die. Verse 20, Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him uh, may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off, verse 21, underline that that phrase, the people stood far off, while Moses drew near to the thick of where, the the thick darkness where God was. Now, I want to uh, make some introductory statements before we move on. Uh, there is this huge misunderstanding with, uh, with worship that God exists for us, his creation. Now, in its true essence, as much as there is some truth to that, it is not the entire truth because the opposite is very true where we exist for God or we exist to worship God. Uh, And I could take verses through the entire scripture where we could talk about why we were creatures of worship. And last week, we talked extensively about why we worship uh, and and how we worship, so on and so forth. But today, I want to continue talking about how to worship. But uh, last week, we talked about the different types of worship. And if I I was to categorize the different types of worship, we talked about idol worship, right? I-D-O-L worship, where uh, I, I talked about how Every one of us worship something on an everyday basis. Uh, Something or the other is worshipped in our lives. Does that make sense? Uh, If you're not worshipping God, you are worshipping Netflix, or you are worshipping your friend, you're worshipping the iPhone that you can't separate from. Uh, You're worshipping something or the other that you have an affinity towards. That which takes your interest, that which uh, magnetizes you, that which uh, takes a lot of your time and takes a lot of your investment of time, Uh, has this tendency of drawing you to worship it or worship them. Now, there's idol worship that we talked about and the different idols that we place in our life. And we talked about how Aaron uh, builds this idol and he feels so bad about it, like a lot of us that build idols. And the, the Bible says he builds an altar in front of the idol. And that's what we do Sunday after Sunday when we come into the presence of God and say, God, you're so good. And we forget that we build idols all week and they're stinking in the back. And we want to make sure that everything looks good by the, I, the, 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 the altar that we build in front of it and say, God's not going to see the idol as long as there's an altar. And we are flawed in that presumption because what we got to understand is worship is either God or mammon. It can't be both. It's either the world or God. You can't worship both. It's an either or equation. It's not an and and equation. So we talked about idol worship. And if I was to categorize the second type of worship, we talked about idol worship. Uh, I don't know why I stressed it that much, but I-D-L-E, idol worship, where it's just spelt different, but uh, that's the kind of worship that's the, the, the worship that's very like, uh, yeah, you don't see it on my face kind of worship. Don't judge me. Uh, I have my own way 
of worshiping. We don't really follow the guidelines of the word of God that tells us how to worship. And we went through a lot of those things. I talked about how so many of us can go through a Sunday service and we can lift our hands and we can sing the words that are on screen and yet we can plan our entire week out and we can plan our grocery, grocery list. We can plan what we're going to do on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, all while lifting up your hands and singing at the same time, right? And that's idol worship where you're easily distracted, where some of us, we're not even worshiping, where we don't understand how we have to portray our emotions and our actions to God in worship, right? Uh, there's this pride involved in idol worship where uh, you're basically saying, oh, I'm not gonna sing because I don't like that song or uh, that's not the kind of song that I like. I'm, I'm more of a hymn person. These guys are just way too loud. It's a pride issue uh, when it comes to that. It's not, it's, it's, yeah, it's, that's not my jam. I, I'll, I'll, I'll sing on the next song. That's, that's, it's not about you. It's not about what you like. We talked about all these things uh, last week, and then we talked about distractions and how that part, that's a part of idol worship, how people and, uh, you know, people on the band and the, and the handsome drummer and, uh, you know, uh, Jobin, shout out to Jobin. Uh, you know, all these people can be, uh, you know, just a distraction in worship. Uh, does that make sense? Now, uh, there, there are people that, that, that say, I can't worship today because I'm going through something. Well, guess what? It's not about you. If you're going through something, worship the one that can take you through that something. That's why you are here where you are. Like we can come up with so many excuses to get away from worship, but then we have to remind ourselves of Hebrews 1 and 12 and verse 2, which says, fix your eyes upon Jesus, right? When we come into worship and when we fix our eyes upon Jesus, nothing, nobody, the, the football teams, the Cowboys or the Texans or whoever you follow will not matter because at that point in time, it is about Jesus and nothing else. And then today, I want to kind of dive into what the third, the third kind of worship or the type of worship, which I call ideal worship, not idol worship or idol worship. It's ideal worship? What is the right kind of worship that God requires of us? Now, we read two passages of scripture. One passage of scripture was when God is talking to Moses in, in chapter number 19, and he's on this mountain, and God tells him this. I'm going to read that again. If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all of the peoples, for all the earth is mine, right? If all they had to do was obey his voice. Now, what that means is you just have to listen to my guidance. Keep your ears open and ask me to dictate. Let me be a GPS. Let me tell you where to go. Let me tell you what to do. And verse six, if you do that, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you, you shall be, is what the Bible says. Someone say, shall be. Shall. It's basically God saying, man, if you do this, this is what you will be. Someone say, be. God has declared that upon them. He said, man, if th this is all I require you is your devotion, is your worship, and this is what I will make you to be, a kingdom of priests. Because here's what Israel was designed to be. It was designed to be where one priest would offer sacrifices for everybody. And we'll talk about that in a bit. That priest will go and they will pray to God for you, uh, will intercede on behalf of everybody. What Moses was kind of doing was basically being the, 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 the person that was in between God and his people, talking on behalf of people. And God said, man, if you can discern my voice, only if you can obey my voice, if you can tune into what I am telling you, man, my desire for all of you is that I want to make you a kingdom of priests, which means I want to make all of you priests. Does that make sense? That is God's desire, that each one of us worships him in spirit and truth, not just the worship leader, not just the person leading worship, not just the person playing an instrument, but God in its truest essence is glorified and he is lifted up. He is, he is worshiped when his people come in one accord and become a kingdom of priests and that can lift his name on high. And he says, only if you obey my voice, I will make you a kingdom of priests. But guess what happens, right? 
So Moses comes down and God says, go tell this to these people. And they come down. Moses comes down and he says, guys, guess what God just said? God said that he wants to make us a kingdom of priests. He wants you to be a priest. He wants you to be a priest. You, 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 me? Yeah, you. Exactly you. Like each and every one of you, no matter if you know how to sing, if you know how to worship, if you're a new believer, an old believer, a, 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 a veteran believer, I don't care how many years you've been baptized, but you, I want to make you a priest. And you know what the people say? The people stood afar. In verse 19, he said, and, and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Now, think about that for a second. God's like, man, this is what I want to give you. I want to make you all a kingdom of priests. And they're like, ah, we're good. We're okay where we are. Moses, you speak to us. You go and listen. And sometimes our worship is like that, man. We're so dependent on people leading us in worship on Sunday mornings. And we're so used to people saying, hey, sing or this or that, that our worship experiences are limited to when people lead us in worship. And we get so used to that, that worship doesn't become a lifestyle anymore because you don't understand. But God's desire is that, man, you need to come close to him. And you know what verse 27 says? 27 21 says, it says the people stood far off while Moses drew closer to God. The only way that you and I can face intimacy with God is when you and I embrace worship in its truest sense. I know so many of us that run away from worship, man. And you know the reason why we ended up with 217 laws that God, some of us think it's only 10 commandments that we had. No, God handed out 217 laws to Moses and said, you know what, if that's how they want to do it, because here's what God, God's offer was, I want to make you. I, you will be, is what God said. And they looked at God and said, no, 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 we're good. Just let Moses tell us what to do. So more than, uh, more than, Lord, we want to be, it was, Lord, we want to do. Stop being doers. Start being beers. I don't know if that makes any sense, but let's go with it. We sometimes have to just learn how to be in the presence of God and stop scrambling to do this and this and how can I do this to get my worship right before God. Sometimes we just have to accept who we are in the presence of God and say, God, I am a worshiper. I'm just here to listen to you. And that's what brings me to this point, man. The Bible says, this, obey my voice and you shall be. And they said, no, 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 we don't want to be. We will just do. And God's like, if you want to do, here you go. 217 laws, go ahead and do. So you know what man ended up doing? Was we tried to do, and because of that, God said, okay, if you want to do it yourself, here you go. These are the laws that you have to stand by. And we struggle every day to meet God because we fall short of these 217 laws. Here's the thing. Without the being, or without be, you cannot do. And that's what the people of Israel did not understand. A lot of us are trying to do God things without being with God. We're trying to do this Christian thing and we're trying to live the spiritual life and we're trying to, you know, do all these being filled with the spirit and, you know, being, be, and I can't feel God. I don't know why. I, feel, I show up to church on Sunday mornings. I, I show up right on time. Pastor Ashish, I don't know why my intimacy with God because you forgot the being part and you're trying to do a lot more than just be. You're trying to meet all the, the things on the list and God's like, man, God is inviting you into relationship and that is what ideal worship is. Ideal worship revolves and hinges and pivots on this one word called relationship. Because here's the thing, a lot of us are trying to have intimacy with a God that we don't have a relationship with. A lot of us are trying to have intimacy with a God that we haven't even met, y'all. Some of us are having, God, I, I want to I wanna be so close to God. I want to have this deep, intimate relationship. We get so envious and jealous of people saying, I heard from God. And you're like, but I can't hear from God. Guess what? I don't know if you followed protocol because having intimacy without even meeting the person or knowing the person is called a one-night stand. It's not called a relationship. I just went there because that's what it is. And a lot of people want to have one night stands with Jesus instead of having relationship with Jesus. 
Write that in your notes. Because it's so important for us to understand that you can't worship unless you understand that worship rests on relationship. Someone say relationship. Worship at the core is about relationship because the way you worship talks a lot about your relationship with the one you worship. If I see your life, if I observe your life, if I see your everyday activities, man, that is a direct portrayal of your relationship with Jesus. The way you worship, your heart of worship, the way you look at worship, the way you're captivated by worship, that's a direct relationship. It shows a direct relationship between your attitude and how you have your relationship with God intertwined, right? Because here's the thing. A lot of us think worship is getting from God, and I said this last week. Worship is not getting from God. Worship is giving to God what he deserves. Over the last 10 years, there's a, there's a word that's been uh, thrown out there that a lot of us are familiar with, and every one of y'all are adults, so I'm very, very free to talk about these things because I want this message to be conveyed in a powerful way. That word is escort. Uh, the word escort has become popular over the last 10 years, and an escort is referred to someone you pay to spend your time with. But here's the thing. You are somebody's friend or you deem somebody as your friend when you can spend time with them and you don't have to pay them. You delight yourself. They delight in spending time with you. Like, if I call you and say, hey, you want to go out for coffee? Like, I don't expect you to give me 10 bucks after that. Right? Like, for me, spending time with you is what makes my day. Like, that changes my day. That uplifts me. That, don't you have that people in your life? It might be your spouse. It might be your friend. It might be your, your, your co-worker. It might be somebody that you're dating. It could be somebody that you want to spend time with all the time, but you don't spend time with them to get something out of it, but you spend time with it because you're invested in it and because you love them deeply. Because that relationship and that moment that you spend with them changes you forever. Can I make a statement right now? When you spend time with God and ask nothing in return, that is what true worship is. When you and I can get into the presence of God and go through an entire hour of worship and not say one thing about what you want from God and just worship him for who he is, worship is revealed in that place. And the Bible says, for God will reign on the praises and the worship of his people. Because at that point, it's not about what can I get from God? Because we can get so engrossed in God, my finances, God, my job, God. Every time we get into worship, it's all about me, 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 me. But when I take focus off me and say, God, today, this is all about you and about your son, Jesus Christ, and what he did for me on the cross, you will understand that worship can change you and transform you because you go from doing to being. And when you are just resting in the presence of God without even worrying about what you're going to get out of it, man, lives are changed at that point. That's what Moses did. He just spent time with God. Not about what he wanted from God. Because worship is connected to awe. You can't worship something that you're not in awe of. How many of you are awed in the presence of God. Like, how many of you literally, when you leave a Sunday morning service, leave with your life changed and your life transformed? If you're ever in a worship situation where you walk in and you leave worse, get out of that place real quick. If you are in a church that gossips more than worships God, get out of that church real quick. If you are a part of a life group that spends more time talking about your interests and spends more time talking about you and you and you and you and less time about Jesus, find another life group. If you have a friend that depresses you more than encourages you, find another friend. Because here's what's going to happen. You are known by the people you hang out with, y'all. If you hang out with Jesus, it will show in your character. 
Haven't you seen, nothing against old people, I love old people, but haven't you seen those old couples that are just like grumpy and they're like, if you look at both the husband and the wife, they're like grumpy all the time. Like they're like literally grumpy. And then you look at other old couples and they're like smiling the whole time and they're like so happy and joyful. And, and I've got a chance to talk to somebody, uh, this, this one couple that was like so happy. They're like 90 years old and they've been married for so many years. And I'm like, guys, why are you guys so happy? It's like y'all are high on something. And, and they're like, no, we're just, you know, like, and, and the wife was telling me, she was like, man, I never started off happy. He was the happy one, but he rubbed off on me. Whew, that's powerful. That is so powerful because here's the thing. If you hang out with people that depress you, there are some people that are called in your life to depress you, man. I'm telling you, you, I don't know how, it's funny. There's at least one friend that you have in your life. You talk to them for five minutes, that's it. Your day is destroyed forever and ever, Amen. It's more important to keep that person on the, the last, put, put under your contact list, put him on the Z and then name because that's the last person you want to see. Don't make him your emergency contact. Are you, are you honest? Like, if you need somebody to lift you up, look for people that can make you better, not, I need to move on. I need to move on. This is, this is, this is God. I'm in. I'm in. Lord, Lord just, Jesus. Because here's the thing. When you come into the presence of God in worship, make sure you are in awe of the presence of God. That's what I was trying to say. Because it's critical that we don't become deadened to wonder because it's astonishment and awe that is raw material for worship. You can worship God more the more you are awed by just who he is. Am I talking to somebody this morning? Because the moment we lose that childlike sense of wonder, man, it's so hard to worship with passion anymore. That's when worship becomes religion. Religion. Worship becomes just a thing that you do. It's not a state of being. It's not, you know, just this, this, this lifestyle that I talked about earlier, yeah, last week. Acts chapter 2, 43. Let's go there real quick. Acts 2 and verse 43. This is what the Bible says. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Anything with Jesus in it, there will be awe and wonder associated with it. There's a reason why products of Jesus and the things that Jesus did were called miracles, signs, and wonders. Because anything that Jesus associates himself with, make sure in your life, make sure that Jesus is associated with awe and wonder in your life, right? Uh, I'm going to go on. Uh, but this is what the Bible says, right? In John chapter 4, go with, go with me to John chapter 4, verses 19. Uh, I'm going to read a few verses for, uh, for the gist of it, and then we can, uh, we, we can talk about it in just a second. Uh, Let's talk about worshiping in spirit and in truth. When talking about how to worship, it's important to understand this aspect of worship of what God requires us to do in, in terms of worshiping him in spirit and in truth. John chapter four, verse 19. This is what the Bible says. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Now there's a huge story behind this, which I'll say in a moment. Uh, let, me, let me say it real quick. Here's, here's Jesus passing through this village and he comes upon, he sends his disciples to go get some food. So the disciples are off to the city to go get some food and he's standing by this well, he's thirsty and in comes this woman who's a Samaritan woman. Now Jews and Samaritans usually didn't talk to each other. Especially a man talking to a woman was considered a big no-no. So here's Jesus right by the well. This woman comes to draw water by the well and Jesus looks at her and says, ma'am, would you give me, uh, would you give me some water and he said she says uh why why are you talking to me you're a jew I'm, uh, and th that whole dialogue happens and jesus says man woman even if, if if you actually know who you're talking to you wouldn't talk to me that way and 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 jesus engages in this conversation with her and says man uh you know and he looks at her and says where's your husband go get your husband and she said i don't have a husband and, she says, and, and jesus says you're right when you say you don't have a husband because you've had five and the one that you have right now is not your husband it's a big story but that's the gist of it and we pick up in verse 19 immediately after that where she hears this amazing revelation about her and she's like, how do you know about me? And, he go, and, she, and the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Verse 20, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is a place where people ought to worship. Now, like she brings up something that like, it's not even relevant to the conversation. Have you, have, do you, don't you have those people? Or you've probably been there sometime in your life. I have a four-year-old that's growing up, right, pretty fast, and she's getting too smart for her own good. And sometimes I look at her, and she's doing something really mischievous. And I look at her and said, Michaela, what are you doing? And she looks at me and says, Dada, look, Carissa, she's eating something. And I'm like, no, 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 that's our, that's our newborn. Like, she's five months old. And she, she has this way of 
like diverting my attention to something else to take away from the fact that she's in trouble. And sometimes I don't see it. Sometimes I do and I'm like, nah, look at me. I'm talking to you. Like this woman's doing that. Like Jesus has caught her and says, ah, ah, you have five, the, the husband, they, they, that's not your husband. And she's like, oh, you're a prophet. But Lord, this mountain, like, like look at this, like check that mountain out. And, and Jesus is like, woman, I'm going to come back to you in just a second. But she looks at, he, she says, this mountain, this is where we worship Jesus, but you Jews... Y'all are different, and, and Jesus goes into this thing of worship, and he says, yeah, I know different people worship different ways, right? Man, you're, you're probably used to this kind of worship. You're probably used to a liturgical kind of worship. You're probably used to a structured worship. You're probably not used to lifting up of hands, or you're not used to lifting up of, 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 of yourselves and lifting up of voices and screaming and shouting. For some of y'all, y'all probably thought, what was wrong with me when I was lifting my hands up there in worship or whatnot? But, but man, there are different people that worship in different ways, and Jesus is talking to the people right now, and he's having this conversation, and he says, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So he says, it doesn't matter if it's the mountain or the temple. That's not what worship is. It's not about the place. It could be in a theater with some crazy letters all around the place. And I bet each one of y'all are like, what in the world is going on over here? Now, let me put you at ease. This is not like sermon props by any means. I could have twisted it and made it sermon props and said this is tongues or something. I, 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 I could have done something, but I'm not going to, right? Let's, let's not go that direction. This is a theater. It's like a primarily a theater, and they have a play that's going on this week, and they have the, the last day of the play is today, I, I think, and they said they're not going to be able to take down the props, and we we're like, it doesn't matter. Jesus is still going to show up, right? So I'm sorry if the letters are taking you back to your kindergarten days, but don't let that to stop you from worshiping God. Is that okay? All right, awesome. I just need to get that out of the way. But, but, but here's the thing, right? Like there's so many things that can come in the way to distract you from, and she's like, man, the, the place matters. Can you really worship in a movie theater or like in a performance? Is Jesus there? But you don't have a cross. You don't have a steeple. What is wrong with you, Commission Church? What kind of a heathen group are you? What are you wearing, jeans? Wow. It doesn't matter. Jesus is like, Different people are going to be worshiping different ways, but he brings it back to the topic in verse 22. And he says, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews, verse 23. But the hour is coming and the hour now and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Man, here's the thing. Worship is something that has to come from the inside. And he breaks it down into two parts, and he says, there is worship from the spirit, and there is worship of the word, of, of truth. You have to worship in spirit and in truth. And he says, that's what true worship is. Like forever, like this is so confusing to me. And sometimes it still is. Like I was preparing this message a few weeks back and I was like, man, you know, why is it so difficult for me to comprehend this? But as God started talking to me, it started making more sense, right? The word spirit in the, the original Greek is the word pneuma. It's, it's breathed upon. It's, it's, it's a breath of fresh air. And what Jesus is trying to say, it's not about the place. It's not about an order, a structure, a denomination. It's not about what, what kind of clothes you wear. It's not kind of liturgical and non-liturgical. It's not structure or Methodist or Presbyterian or Pentecostal or non-denominational. All those things don't matter. He's basically saying, man, when you worship, forget about all those things because the opposite of spirit is what? Is the body because anything we try to do with the body, anything we try to do with the flesh is all these man-made things that we build. And God's like, worship is not man-made. It is not anything that you put together by your own self. It's not restricted to buildings that are man-made. And he's saying, worship is about worshiping in the spirit. So no matter where I put a worshiper in, you will still worship God. 
I could put you in a palace, you will worship God. I could put you in a pit, you will worship God. I could put you in a prison, you will worship God. I will put you in a job that you don't like, you will still worship God because worship is not tied to circumstance. Worship is in the spirit, which means you're worshiping a God that doesn't, is not limited to a structure or a place. He's a God that will go with you wherever you go. He's a God that is with you and for you no matter what you do. I got him on one and he says, in, tr- in, in truth, the word over there, used over there is the word alithia, which means unconcealed or not hidden. Your, your worship shouldn't be a lie, y'all. Like when we worship God, let it be true worship. Let it be the truth. Let it be genuine worship. Someone say genuine worship. What does that mean? Genuine worship is where you can come and not put on a face in front of God. God doesn't want to see a two-faced person worshiping him, man. That used to be me. I would come into the presence of God and I'm like singing and dancing and on my knees and on my face and I'm rolling all around the place and God's like, that's all awesome, Ashish. You're dancing and all that's good. And he looks at me and says this, Ashish, if you don't do what you do here in front of thousands of people or hundreds of people or 40 people or 50 people, if you don't do all of this stuff, in the four walls of your bedroom when nobody's watching, don't you dare come and do it when people are watching you. Like I was like, uh, shots fired. Sorry, Jesus. Like, I'm for real, y'all. That was so convicting to me that sometimes we make worship about us or, or how it has to be portrayed, but God's like, no, worship is this intimate experience. It's this lifestyle, man. Like, that's what I mentioned. True worship is like, here's what I, what I thought about when I, when I heard worship is a lifestyle. I thought people were just walking around worshiping all the time. Like when you're cooking, you're worshiping, you have worship music, and if you don't know the words, that's not true worship. But God started revealing to me and saying, no, everything you do in life and everything God has given you to do, it could be, you could be a mom at home and you could be changing your baby's diaper and if you do it right, you're worshiping God because through that, uh, man, you're doing things perfectly. It could be you at work and you're crunching numbers and if you're doing right and you're doing it faithfully and justly, man, that is worship unto God. When you have noble thoughts, when you have good thoughts, when you, when you are right before God, there is so much of truth that is in worship. That's why Jesus exposes this woman's deepest secret, brings it out, and connects it to worship because worship is connected to vulnerability. When we say worship is truth, it means you and I have to be free to come into the presence of God and be vulnerable in the presence of God. He's speaking about this lifestyle of worship that's aided by the power of the Holy Spirit and dwelling inside the believer, man. And this is where it gets interesting. Uh, thankfully, Paul in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and I'm going to try to explain this as fast as I can over the next seven to eight minutes. Uh, in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul explains how worship, the, worshiping the Lord in spirit and truth is basically about adopt, adopting this lifestyle of worship. Go with me real quick. Let me teach you from Romans 12, uh, 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this word, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you, uh, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, he beseeches us. He basically says, guys, can I please, like that word, I appeal is his word, can I please tell you this? This is important for you to understand. Can you take this? Can you run with this? It's this, this, this pleading that he does, right? He's saying, guys, please understand when I tell you this, right? And he says, how do you worship? One, I want to leave three points with you. Is that cool real quick? Uh, one, with dedication. He says, giving of yourself. To dedicate means to give to God what is his. When we dedicate a house, we basically saying, God, this is your house. When we dedicate children to the Lord, we dedicate them and we give them to the Lord. The first point that I want you to write down is how to worship is with dedication of giving yourself. That's what the Bible says. Present your bodies as a sacrifice, alive, holy, and pleasing to God. In Greek, the word paristemi is used in the place of present. It means to yield. 
What does it mean to present? It means, man, the right kind of worship is where you bring yourself, you make yourself presentable, you make yourself available. When you come into worship, make sure you're 100% available. Like I said earlier, we don't need to be thinking about the NFL scores. We don't need to be thinking about basketball. We don't need to be thinking about any kind of food that we're going to have after service, the restaurants that we're going to go to during the week, the people that we're going to hang out with. All that stuff can wait. When you're at worship, prepare yourself and ready yourself for worship. Guess what? Everybody showed up on time this week. A lot of y'all showed up on time. I, I challenged you guys last week and I said, hey guys, we're going to have breakfast. How many of y'all got breakfast this morning? Can I see your hands? Okay, a few of y'all. If you didn't get breakfast, we have leftover breakfast. After service is done, it's probably going to be cold, but that's what you get for not showing up on time. I just had to put that out there. But here's... Here, but, but, but I challenged everybody and I said, guys, part of worship is to be available, is to be present, to say, here I am, I'm ready, I'm, I'm here to worship God. And when you come to worship, it's like showing up for your work. You don't show up 10 minutes early, uh, sorry, 10 minutes late. You do show up early if you can, right? My boss used to say, man, the best kind of early is when you show up one minute early, right? That's, uh, if, if, you're one, one, if you're on time, you're late, is what my boss used to say. But when we come into the presence of God, can we come prepared? You have to present yourself. To present your body to God is to surrender your whole self to him. To present your body to God is to say, Lord, I am yours, everything that I am. My body, my soul, my mind, my worries, my, you know, I am your humble servant. Like in humility to say, God, here I am. That's what Moses said when he approached the fire of God on that mountain. He looks at God and he says, here I am, which means nobody else has my attention. Nothing else has my attention. The people around you, don't have your attention at that moment. It is all about God. Not the time to read your Bible. Not the time to check your email. Not the time to check your fantasy football points. Not the time to get your roster ready. I get that done on Monday, the previous week. <laughs> Not Sunday morning, Ajit. Just kidding. Ajit doesn't even check his fantasy. <laughs> Everyone keeps beating him. I just had to throw that out there. I'm, I'm calling people out today. But here's the thing. He puts three conditions and he said, present yourself alive, holy, and pleasing. He says, alive, holy, and pleasing. I don't have too much time to get into this, but I'm going to go through a live real quick and we'll continue next week. Is that cool? Yes, Y'all want me to continue? Like go over time? We can go to 1.30 if y'all want. But let's not. Okay, so, so alive. The Bible says, uh, present yourselves alive. What does that mean? It means that uh, in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, when they worshipped, when people worshipped, they would come into the presence of God and the priest would help them worship. So they would bring an animal, right? When they, when they bring sacrifices, it could be a dove, it could be an animal, it could be a sheep, a goat, it could be a ram. Whatever they brought into the house of God, they would bring their sacrifice and they would bring it alive. They would bring it alive. Right? And what would happen is they would put it at the altar and that which was alive, the animals under the old covenant would be brought alive to the altar, but once sacrificed, they were dead. But you know what happened? Jesus happened. Jesus happened and Jesus said, uh, I'll be that sacrifice. He went up on the cross of Calvary. He took your sin, my sin, that, that lamb that we should have taken, that sacrifice that we should have done every day for our sins. He was that sacrifice. He went up there. And because of that sacrifice that Jesus did for us, man, it doesn't take away the fact that we still have to come to the altar and sacrifice because true worship is being worshiping and sacrificing in an alive state, not coming and crucifying yourself because he crucified himself for you. It's about bringing yourself when you walk in alive. God says, what I will do is by my stripes, I will take everything that is dead inside of you. Even though you think you are alive. Am I talking to somebody? What you're doing is you're walking dead. You're like the walking dead. You walk in like a zombie. You're walking in like a zombie that's filled with sin. You think you're alive, but God's like, no, 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 no. What I do is I take that which is dead and I make it 
alive. And that is happening because Jesus paid the price on the cross of Calvary. Today, you and I can approach the throne room of heaven with all our misery, with all our pain, with all our shortcomings. Let me tell you something. Let me urge you. Go into the presence of God and he will take every dead situation and he will make it alive in the name of Jesus. That's the God that I worship. Would you stand up to your feet with me? Man, under the new covenant, the exact, is opposite. The, the, ex- the exact opposite is true. We who were dead in our tres- trespasses and in our sins, God made us alive. And having been made alive by the Spirit, all right, having been, that's what the Bible says, having been made alive by the Spirit, we then present our bodies to God as a sacrifice that's living. Every day when you approach the presence of God, I pray that your bodies will be in the presence of God as a sacrifice. What does that mean? Ask Him to cut you up, man, every single day. When I approach the presence of God in worship and in, in, in song and in brokenness, I look at God and say, God, do a work in my heart today. God, I, I don't have it together. I'm it might look like that. People might think I might have it all together, but Lord, would you, would you cut me? Would you slice me? Would you do what you need to do in my life to take away what I don't need? Worship is about sacrifice and coming into the presence of God and saying, God, I'm dead. God, I'm just, I don't have it all together. Would you just pull me together and make me whole? Worship is coming into the presence of God and just surrendering everything and saying, God, here I am dead but would you make me alive because here's the thing in the new covenant we're volitionally bringing ourselves to God as a living sacrifice he says present yourself make sure your worship is volitional make sure your worship is intentional make sure your worship is something that you intend to do wake up every day morning and say I'm going to be a worshiper today Every morning when you wake up from bed, and I say this often, the devil should be afraid that you woke up. Hell should quiver that Priya woke up in the morning and saying, ah, a worshiper is awake today. Because you know what? what here's, here's the thing. You know what the devil is most afraid of? Somebody that worships God. Because the only reason he was kicked out of heaven was on that point, that he did not want to worship God, he wanted worship to himself. And he's going to try everything in his capacity to make you from not worshiping, to keep you from worshiping God. And if he succeeds at it, he's okay, he's happy. You don't have to demon worship. You don't have to devil worship. You don't have to Satan worship for you to be a satanic worshiper. You just don't have to worship God. That makes you a satanic worshiper. Am I talking to somebody? Somebody's like, oh, that's too harsh, brother. That's the truth. Because as long as he can get you to worship Netflix, as long as he can get you to spend more time on your phone than with Jesus, he's good. As long as he can get you to spend more time with your boyfriend or girlfriend than with Jesus, he's good. But when my devotion is to the one that created me, Nothing else matters. I come into the presence of God dead, but he makes me alive. But there's one thing I know in worship. Every dead situation that I've faced in my life, when I've approached the throne room of grace and worship, he has taken it into his hands and he has made it new. Could you try God today? If you're not used to being a worshiper, why don't you try worshiping? And a lot of people confuse worship with music. That's not what I'm talking about. Please get it right. Worship is not music. For some of us, worship is only Sunday morning experience. That's not it. Worship is your attitude every day morning when you wake up with God consciousness saying today I'm going to kill it because Jesus is on my side and all I'm going to think about is Jesus. Not my problems, not my issues, but when I think about Jesus, when I put my mind on things above, every big thing that seems to exalt itself above the mind of God 
weak becomes diminished because at that point in time I'm not thinking about it I'm thinking about God I'm in a state of being not in a state of doing don't be the Israelites that said I don't want to be I want to do say God today I decide to be some of us just need to be just rest in God's presence and guess what you don't need to do stuff you don't need to sing you don't need to worship you don't need to be on your knees you can you can just be in the presence of God sometimes worship is just about meditation sometimes in the morning my, my five, five month old daughter she wants to wake up at five in the morning every day morning five five thirty she's up and guess what I'm up with her I can't just look at her and be like cry away baby I take her and I bring her and sometimes she's in my arms cooing away but in that cooing I just close my eyes and sometimes I switch on my Spotify or I put some worship music on because my wife knows and all of you know that I'm not gifted in singing so sometimes I just try to meditate and what that entails is just close your eyes and just think about Jesus just to think about how good he has been to you. Woo! And I'm telling you something, when you think about how good he has been to you over the last 10 years, just think about when he came through for you in the time that you thought you were not going to make it, when that car was about to crash into you, and when you thought that that day was going to be your last day, did you take your mind back three years ago when you remind yourself of Jesus, guess what you're doing? You are worshiping. Because your mind is on Jesus. Jesus at the center of it all. That's what it's about. Would you close your eyes with me this morning?